Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. If you're going to be exposed to any amount of media, including horror, you'll soon be acclimatized to the idea that being imprisoned reveals a so-called truth about the world. That being that when you get out of any imprisonment, well, it comes with you. The world that you re-enter becomes just a bigger prison. Maybe this will give you something to think about listening to tonight's story. My grandfather knew what happened in the Dyatlov Pass incident by drunken swordsmen. My grandfather committed suicide in 2019. I translated his diary and found out what he was hiding from us since back in 1958. This is his story. If you're confused, you should probably start back at the beginning. December 29th, 1958. I was trapped in my cell for five days. Hunger and cold took their toll on me. I would have died of dehydration, but there was a small, filthy toilet in the corner of my room. After a day, my thirst overcame my revulsion, and I drank from it greedily. The water only lasted two days, and thirst quickly added itself to my list of tormentors. The lights went out after several hours, as whatever happened to the base above destroyed the generators, plunging me into darkness. I was almost relieved, unable to see the dried red stain around the door. I was starving and freezing, but my real enemy was my own mind. I could still hear the carnage outside echoing in my mind, the inhuman screaming, the desperate gunfire, the sounds of a whole military base unable to stop whatever had come out of that cave. When I heard the sound in the corridor outside, I thought that I had to be hallucinating. I hadn't heard anything but my own voice for days. I rolled over on the floor and ignored it. But then it came again. Footsteps, slow, wary, echoing down the abandoned hall. They were getting closer, heading right for my cell. I leaped to my feet, swaying as my head swam. There was nothing in my cell that I could use as a weapon. I bared my fists, turning in the dark to where I thought the door was, and something grabbed a hold of the heavy iron bar, locking it, and scraped it loudly as it was drawn up. And then the door crashed open. A blinding light shone into my eyes. I cringed backward, my illusions of putting up a fight gone in a rush of terror. I shrank backwards, raising my arms to protect my eyes. Mikhail! Mikhail, stay calm! It's me! It was Yuri's voice. The light swung downwards and I squinted at its source. Yuri stood in the cell door, one hand gripping a battery-powered light, the other holding his pistol. Yuri? What... What are you doing here? I, th I thought everyone was dead. I slurred. Not everyone. I'm sorry it took me so long, Mikhail. I didn't know that you were in this cell. I thought you died, like almost everyone else. Sergei, that bastard only told us yesterday that you were locked up when it happened. <sighs> Water. I mumbled, the edges of my vision darkening. I fell to one knee, and Yuri rushed over, pulling a canteen from his belt. Here, drink up. There's more above. I grabbed the canteen and tore it open, wolfing down whatever water was inside. I wanted to thank him, I'd ask him a thousand questions, but my body didn't allow it. Darkness folded in around me, and I felt myself falling. That was two days ago. When I awoke, I found myself in a mess hall on level one. The survivors of whatever happened on level five, some fifty soldiers in total, have holed up here. We have fires, food, and water. When I recovered, I immediately asked Yuri about what had happened to the base. We don't even know, he answered, a flash of fear crossing his face. One moment, everything was normal. The next, people were screaming, Mikhail. Then they dropped uh, blood at the mouth and someone else would start screaming. We tried killing whoever it took, but it would always jump to someone else. What? 
How is that even possible? I don't know, Mikhail. It shouldn't be. And yet, out of the 500 men on this base, now there are only 50 alive. And we only survived because we hid. Whatever took these men, it seems that if it can't see you, you're safe, or at least safer. Well, what happened when everyone in sight was dead? Yuri sighed. The last four men to be taken by it, uh, them, they never stopped screaming. They ran into the waste outside. It, we haven't seen them since. We sat in silence for a while. What happened to Sergei? I asked finally. Yuri smiled, a flash of his old attitude warming his face for a second. He's been uh, relieved of command, you could say. When it was all over, he appeared unharmed and tried to make us follow the screaming men out into the dark. We wouldn't have it. He shot old Lebedev before we could restrain him. Well, where is he now? In the other mess hall on this level. He hasn't answered any questions about what the hell happened, and he stays silent most of the time. But uh, come along, I'll take you to him. We picked our way through the men lying and sitting around our makeshift shelter. Everyone was quiet, the loudest voice a whisper. Even though these men had survived the horrors from level 5, something, something within them had died. Sergei lay in the corner of the second mess hall, his hands and legs bound. When we approached, he smiled mirthlessly. Private Sidorov. It seems Yuri's hope of rescuing you was not as foolish as I thought. You're lucky to be alive. As are you, Commander. I retorted, barely keeping my anger at bay. Care to tell us what the hell is happening here? Those are state secrets, Private. I can't tell you anything. Yuri snorted. You've already failed the Union, Sergei. Whatever we were here to guard, it's escaped. Best you tell us what it was, and maybe we can salvage something from the situation. The former commander looked directly at Yuri, dolefully. I did what was in my power to guarantee the safety of this facility. There was nothing more I could have done. Yuri swore savagely and spat on the ground at Sergei's feet before turning around and stalking off. I followed after him. All right. What's our next move, Yuri? I asked once I caught up to him. We have to do something. We, we have to get to army command to warn them this whole area needs to be locked down as soon as possible. Come outside with me, Mikhail. I followed my friend, confused as to what he intended by this. As we walked through the abandoned base and out into the freezing night, I realized what he wished for me to witness. From somewhere out in the dark, the faint sounds of men screaming carried to my ears. They're still out there, Mikhail, somewhere. We've sent out patrols trying to find them. They either return with no information or they don't return at all. So what does that mean for us? We don't know where they are. We don't have the gear to take the trek to reach civilization. For all purposes, we're trapped here. January 2nd, 1959. We have remained camped in the remainder of level one. Sergei hasn't talked. Three men didn't return from patrol today. January 7th, 1959. Five more men have gone missing on patrol since my last entry. Food and water are still in supply, but we're running out of cigarettes. January 12th, 1959. Seven more men are dead. Sergei remains silent, and there has been talk among the survivors of executing him. January 19th, 1959. There is little reason for me to continue this diary other than keeping track of our losses. Twelve more men have been lost to the Screaming Ones. Sergei hasn't spoken in three days, and there are no more cigarettes. 
January 25th, 1959. Today, the screaming came closer to our base than ever before, all the way to the ruined entry gate. We lay low, gripping rifles in terror, mumbling prayers and curses. Thank God it passed after half an hour, moving somewhere down the mountain. Four men went to follow it, swearing to kill the screaming men from a range, and they haven't returned. January 28th, 1959. Today, Sergei finally talked. We haven't fed him in days and only gave him small amounts of water. Finally, he cracked. He agreed to talk to us. He never pleaded, never begged. He's still Sergei, angry, prideful, utilitarian. But now we know a bit about what we're dealing with here. We never opened the cave, not once in five years. He told us through parched lips. The best scouting equipment in all the Union was used to give us some idea of what was happening on the other side of the rockfall. Our best guess was the four trapped men were just standing there for five years, standing there screaming. And no one ever tried to open the cave, a soldier growled. What would you have? We didn't know what was in there, what was in the soldiers. We don't, even now. And how did they get outside, I demanded. The cave is still sealed. How could they escape? Your guess is as good as mine, Private Sidorov. Sergei smiled, his head lolling. Maybe they were gathering strength. Maybe they were biding their time. Maybe, given five years of doing nothing, they could pass through solid rock with the same ease they passed through flesh. Well, whatever happened to the men in the space, it only happened to those in a direct line of sight from the screaming ones, said Yuri. Whatever way it moved outside the cave, it doesn't seem that it can do it again. That's how we all survived, after all. Sergei grinned at Yuri. By hiding like cowards. Yuri lashed out fast as a snake. Sergei's head snapped back and blood sprouted from his burst lip. Despite everything, he kept on grinning. And what do you plan to do now, Private Ivanovich? Our only chance was to follow and kill those things, and instead, you turned on me. The soldiers around him started to disperse with mutters of disgust. It was clear that we would get no more from our former commander. Grudgingly, I gave him a canteen of water. It seems we will all die here. Either the Screaming Ones find us or we die out there in the snow one by one. If anyone finds this diary, God be with you, for he has abandoned us. January 30th, 1959. Five more men down. We are now only 14. Yuri, thankfully among them. Sergei still lives, and has been moved to our mess hall to be better guarded. February 1st, 1959. May God have mercy on my soul. Today's events will haunt me till the day I die. It was approaching nightfall when a patrol, the last two men brave enough to volunteer to search the mountain, ran into our shelter. The sentries leaped up, rifles raised, expecting trouble. There's people! People on the mountain, one of the scouts yelled. I sprang to my feet and ran over to them, Yuri close behind me. Who? Where? I demanded. On the slope, we counted nine. They're setting up camp as we speak. The remaining soldiers gathered round the patrol. Are they military? Yuri asked. Could they have radios? Can we contact command? No, they're civilians. A uh, hiking expedition, it seemed, the patrolman answered. A dejected quiet fell on the room. Our hopes, so quickly erased, were crushed just as fast. And a single voice broke the silence. Sergei's. Bait. We looked over at him, confused. What are you talking about, you son of a bitch? asked one of the survivors. What do you mean, bait? Those people on the mountain. 
The things in the Screaming Men don't know we are here, so they haven't come for us. But they will see those hikers. They will come for them. And that gives us an advantage. We know where they're going to be. We know what they're going to do. Yuri walked over to the bound commander. What are you proposing? Even if they get to the hikers, we can't kill them without exposing ourselves. <sighs> You're sitting on a military base's worth of weapons and explosives, Ivanovich. Outside, there's a mountain covered in snow. We get out there, we prime this slope with explosives, we hide and wait. When the things come for the hikers, we wait until they're screaming, then we drop that slope on them. If the avalanche doesn't kill them, we will finish them off before they know what hit them. Yuri was quiet for a second. Suppose we did all this, he said at last. Suppose we managed to cause an avalanche, but the things survive. How do we know we'll be able to kill them? We tried and failed when they broke free. It's either this or you stay here and die slowly, one by one. Your choice. There was a second of silence, and then Yuri nodded. If we are to go down, we go down fighting. Around him, the survivors were rising to their feet and muttering in agreement. A fire in their eyes that had been extinguished for a month had been rekindled. They had intent. They had hope. One more thing, added Sergei, lifting his bound hands. Free me. Yuri hesitated for a second. Then he stepped forward, drew his knife, and cut Sergei's bonds. After this, a page is left empty. Everything happened quickly after that. We gathered explosives from the armory, the grenades and demolition charges, and stalked out into the night. The hikers had pitched their tent under the mountain. A dull glow came from inside, the light of lamps illuminating it from within. The screams still came, faint on the air. It's possible the campers didn't hear them. Maybe they mistook them for the howling of the wind. Whatever it was, they stayed inside their tent. Our small group crept along the mountain above, anxious in the dark. Every movement in the black night was full of terror. It took us only a few minutes to plant the explosives on the slopes above the tent. Having prepared our trap, we stalked away, taking cover in a tree line about a kilometer away from the camp, and then we waited. For several hours we sat in the cold, freezing and terrified. Sergei held the detonator, having assumed command by force of his expertise and some residual authority. It seemed like an eternity of waiting, but then it finally came, the moment we'd been dreading. The screams on the wind got closer and louder, approaching the tent. We saw the things coming, four specks of black on the white snow running down the mountain towards the hikers. There was a commotion in the tent, shadows moving inside in panic, and as one, the voices on the wind went silent. The bodies fell limp in the snow and four fresh screams arose from the camp. See, even when you get out, the walls are still there, just in different forms, it seems. Stay scary, wildlings. Try not to carry a prison in your mind and make the most of your nights.